Hi, this is Dr. Karen Becker, and today I have a very special guest. My guest, Dr. Ronald Schultz, who is here with us. Actually, I'm at his facility at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Schultz heads up the Pathobiological Sciences Department. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for coming. It's a um, cold day here in Wisconsin. Um, Dr. Schultz, prior to the interview, was telling me a little bit about how when he arrived here 29 years ago? 29 years ago. 29 years ago, he was the sole, uh, I call him an immunologist, and veterinary immunology is really where his specialty is in terms of focus for education and research. But he came here as the first uh, pathobiological sciences person. Correct. And you now, tell me a little bit about your department. Well, we now have about 150 faculty, staff, and students in the department. It's the largest of the four departments here in the school. And we have responsibility for a variety of subjects, including bacteriology, immunology, virology, parasitology, public health, epidemiology, and clinical and anatomic pathology. So yes. it, it is a big group yes. and an important group within any veterinary school. Yes, it is. Part of the reason that I was so excited about having Dr. Schultz join us today is that um, if you begin thinking about vaccine decisions for your pets, you will absolutely come across not only Dr. Schultz's information, but um, he's involved in about every aspect of the vaccine topic from working with vaccine manufacturers, to putting together protocols, testing protocols. He's the man that's actually in the lab doing the research, which is, um, it's an honor to have you here with us. So in, so in light of all of that information, many of you on the Healthy Pets website have questioned me about what to do about vaccines. It's probably one of the most hotly debated topics in veterinary medicine. And part of the reason it's so hotly debated is we of course want to be able to provide protection to our pets. But there's a big difference between providing protection in terms of giving them immunologic protection against life-threatening diseases and over-vaccination. And there's probably no one in the world more well-versed in this discussion than you. So <laughs> rabies, there's a one-year product in some states and a three-year product. Right. Talk a little bit about why there's not a 12-year rabies or a 20-year rabies or a seven-year well, rabies. Well, thanks for asking that question because uh, as you know, we're doing some yes, studies right now yes, to try and demonstrate a minimum duration of immunity for rabies at, at seven years, mm -hmm. so we can extend that period. So right now, the reason that we don't have one of those products is no one has really done the studies yeah. to demonstrate that you can go beyond three years. Mm -hmm. And those studies are really and expensive. They are very, it very takes expensive. A ton of time. So, you know, seven years, it takes, yeah, it yes. takes a long time. And for old people like me, uh, that means I had to, I should have started That's earlier. Right. That's right. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it, it's something that we're hoping to be able to demonstrate. And we're in the fourth year yes. of that particular study. So we would like to uh, really come uh, with the information that says you can vaccinate an animal at uh, 12 to 24 weeks of age and uh, you don't need to necessarily uh, vaccinate it uh, every three years the way we do now. And uh, by the way, every one of the states now in the United States All has a three-year three -year rabies law, but you have to know that you may live in a municipality, a city or a county. They can be more restrictive than the state, but they can't be less restrictive. So some of those states, all of which now have three-year laws, your county or your city may require every two years or every one year. What I would recommend to every animal owner and you are the ones that have the ability to change these laws is get out there and change that county or city or town law mm -hmm. to three years because there is absolutely no scientific reason mm -hmm. for you to be vaccinating any animal more often than three years with products that are licensed by the mm -hmm. USDA for three years. Mm -hmm. So the next puppy in your life mm -hmm. Talk to me about what you would do in terms of vaccine protocol for him or her. Well, I feel very comfortable and confident about the effectiveness of vaccines. I'm also a risk taker. Uh, I 
ride motorcycles, I have a pilot's license, etc. And not everyone feels as comfortable taking right. risks that as I be, do. And that would be me. Yes. yes. So you have to put it in that context to begin with. And a lot of people then, after I tell them that, immediately think, well, <laughs> I wouldn't do any of those yes. things that, that he does. Yes. But with regard to vaccines, there are not a whole lot of people that know more about veterinary vaccines than I do. That's so right. I'm not really taking very much of a risk at all with my pet or my children's or my grandchildren's pets. And so uh, what, what I would do is I would probably, because I can do antibody titers, I would know when I could effectively immunize that puppy and I would give the, the puppy the core vaccines, distemper, parvo, and adeno. At that time, I would check it then two or more weeks later to make sure that it has responded. And I would probably not revaccinate the animal yep. again for the rest of its life, which I've been doing since 1974. Yep. Would I give um, uh, a rabies vaccine? Absolutely, and that is considered a core, but I was referring just to the distemper parvo adeno part of the core. Now, my uh, protocol for rabies is not dictated by my understanding of immunology. It's dictated by the law. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, I would give the first dose of rabies sometime after uh, four months of age. And in this state, it better be shortly thereafter, otherwise I would be in violation of the state rules. And then I would revaccinate at a year or within a year of that, and then uh, every three years. So there we have it. That's that's what I would do, and that's because of the law, yes. not because yes. of that being necessary immunologically. That's right. There is a big difference between being immunologically um, uh, able to respond and being compliant with the law. So the law doesn't state that they want your dog immunologically uh, responsive. The law states that you have to give rabies vaccine every three years. So if you choose not to do it, you could, you're simply choosing to break the law, which is, of course, people's choice. Uh, if but you, we're not advocating you know, that. That's right. We're not suggesting that you do anything illegal because we're morally upright, law-abiding citizens. Correct. But if you choose to break the law, you, it is important to recognize that your dog may have lifelong protective immunity after a single rabies vaccine. And if you decide to be a rebel, which we're not advocating, but that if you were a rebel, your dog could still have protection or cat cell protection for the rest of his or her life. And that's why we're doing this study to try and get that type of yes. information to see whether or not we may only have to revaccinate every uh, seven years right. instead of every three years. Mm -hmm which would mean that uh, a dog could really end up uh, only getting three to four rabies at the very most. Uh, and that, that would be uh, going from what used to be annual mm -hmm. to three to four in a lifetime, which yeah. would be a real, it would real be an advantage. Even, even more of an improvement would be a seven-year vaccine. In theory, having your pets receive two, three. Yeah, that's right. Correct. Um, so, so research is underway. Right. And it's all because of you. Really, truly, Dr. Schultz, you are single-handedly changing um, the face of enologic veterinary medicine. And we are all so grateful for all the work you do, for your effort and your passion towards what you do, and for helping all of us be able to make better decisions for the animals in our care. We're wholeheartedly thankful for everything that you do.